Well, here we are in love for life, building or rebuilding a great marriage. This is lesson 12 and uh, this morning's particular lesson is part three in a section entitled uh, Blended Family. I, I just want to mention again uh, one of the books that I used to, to draw some of this uh, material. Not everything obviously out of the book, but if you're, if you're interested in this topic, this is a, uh, this is a good book uh, to, uh, to uh, refer to uh, to get information about blended uh, families. All right, a little review about what we've talked about so far. So far we focused on the most common type of blended family. I told you there are many types of blended family, but the most common type is uh, the family that's produced by a subsequent marriage, meaning a second marriage or a third marriage. And some important ideas to remember. Uh, first of all, uh, remarrying involves the integration of two families, not just two people. It's two families that are being integrated, not just individuals. And also that care should be given to children's conditions and fears and needs, very real things, have to allow them time to grieve the loss of their former family, and also recognize that children of different ages have different needs when it comes to being integrated into a blended family. So a toddler doesn't need the same thing as a five or six year old. So in the final lesson today, we're going to look at some of the other challenges faced by those who find themselves in blended families as children or about to enter into this situation through marriage or some other change. Now, I don't want to give the impression that the only things connected to blended families are problems and challenges. But a lot of times people enter into these situations and they're not aware of the things that they may have to face. You know, someone who's been married before and then remarries uh, you know, and brings their children into another marriage, they're saying, well, I know, all been I know all about marriage. I've been married before. Or, hey, I've been divorced twice. I know everything about marriage. Well, you know, maybe if you've been divorced twice, you know, there may be some things you didn't learn. So we need to think about that. So when you're stepping in as a step parent, because I've talked about when you're, when you're getting married and I've talked about in the previous lessons about the adjustments you have to make as an adult entering into this type of relationship, but you also enter the relationship, many, uh, many do, you enter as a step parent into a relationship. So parenting, you know, it's a difficult job under the best of circumstances, but when you have to parent a child that is not your own, you know, not your own biological child, the degree of difficulty increases significantly. For example, there's the difficulty of parenting around visitation schedules in, in a, well, let's call it a, a nuclear family. So when I talk about a nuclear family, I, means, or, I mean original mom, original dad, and original kids, okay? So in a nuclear family, you don't have to deal with visitation things. But in a blended family, many times there's visitation. You have to parent around those things. Or the problems associated with parenting his or her children. You know, parenting a child that is not your bio child, along with the bio mother of that child, that's a, that's a, a challenge, a lot of problems there. Of course, there's also the interference from the ex-spouse and the ex-spouse's family. They have a say. You make a rule, you do a thing, then they go on visitation or something and all those rules go out the window. Rejection from the children themselves, especially older children, you know, they just shut down, they're passive aggressive, you know, they don't cooperate with the step-parent. I don't like you, uh, you're maybe my mom or my dad loves you, but uh, you know, that's not me. You're not my dad, you're not my mom. There's a lot of that. And of course, indecision of your spouse to allow you to fully parent their child. On Monday, yeah, you can be the, the mom, you know, but on Tuesday, no, no, uh, you know, I'm going to be the mom. In other words, it, it blows hot and cold, whether you have the right to parent that child or not. Depends how the other parent feels. There's that difficulty. And then there's lack of any parenting experience. How many individuals go into a blended family never having had children of their own? And now all of a sudden, they, you know, the, the good thing about nuclear family is when your child is one day old, 
you have one day of experience as a parent. When your child is two days old, you have two days experience as a parent and so on and so forth. But it, when you're a step parent stepping into a, a marriage where there are children who are five years old or eight years old, that kid's got eight years experience being a kid and you've got zero experience being a parent. So that's a challenge as well. So these are just some of the common problems that step parents face in blended family situations. I'm not saying they're not, you, know, you can't overcome these things, but you have to understand these are very real things. So when faced with these challenges, the one thing for new parents or new step parents to remember is to remember the original reason for being there in the first place, and that is the love of the partner. When things get difficult and confusing, the one motivating factor needs to be the original love for the spouse. That love is what makes it all work somehow. You got into that family because you love that person and grew to love their child or children and vice versa. That's the basis for that. So when you step into a new role, you know, step parents don't have a, a, always a positive image. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. It's difficult to break the stereotype of step parenting, especially if you step into a, a family where there are children that are like teenagers or tweens, because you have no experience perhaps, or you're seen as an intruder or mean, call it the Cinderella syndrome. And sometimes in these types of relationships, partners give confusing and mixed messages. Sometimes my partner asks me to act like a parent and take the initiative, sometimes. And then sometimes my partner tells me to just be a step parent and check with them first. So on Monday, if something happens, you know, you're the, the bio parent will tell the step parent, well, why didn't you do something? Well, you're, you know, you're a parent now, you've got to step in and you know, blah, blah, blah. And then on Tuesday, something else happens and they say, oh yeah, in that situation, you know, step back, I'll handle that. Pretty confusing way to parent children. And then sometimes my partner just wants me to butt out because this matter deals with his children. This is my child, and you really don't have experience in this, so just step aside and you know, when it comes to this, I'm the one that deals with this. And yet the step parent is expected to love these stepchildren as if they're their own. So you know, we've got two things going on here. I want you to love my children as if they were your own children. However, I don't want you to do this, I, you can't do that, you can't step in and do this, you can't discipline, well, you know, it doesn't work that way. So the answer for step parents is not to try to recreate the role or the style of the original biological parent who's gone, but rather develop the style and character of our heavenly father who is the model for parents both male and female. If I'm a step parent, I'm not modeling myself on my partner or I'm not modeling myself on the ex, I'm modeling myself on the Lord. That's my model for being a parent. So this includes a variety of qualities. First of all, gracious love. What am I aiming to be as a step parent? Well, I'm aiming to be an individual that has gracious love. You know, John 3.16, so God so loved the world. And in my situation, I may say, well, you know, for I so loved these children. We're shooting to be fair. In Romans chapter 10, verse 12, Paul says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him. So I'm, I'm aiming to be a fair person. I'm also aiming to be attentive. In Luke 12, six and seven, Jesus says, are not five sparrows sold for two uh, cents? yet not one of them is forgotten before God, so on and so forth. I, I'm shooting to be attentive to the needs of the children, even if they're not my biological children, they're children and they have needs. I love them or I'm going to attempt to love them because I love you. 
And part of that love is I'm going to pay attention to their needs, their emotional needs, their spiritual needs, and of course their physical needs as well. And I'm aiming to exercise discipline Again, Hebrews 12, you know, have you forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. The Lord disciplines us. If I'm aiming to be a godly parent, that means that I'm also aiming to exercise godly discipline. Not discipline in anger, shouting, screaming, but godly discipline that is tempered with fairness and love. So to this love, however, step-parents need to realize some of the significant changes that have taken place in their new position. Because when they do this, it helps to sort out the, the new problem. In other words, at one point you were here in your life and now through a series of circumstances you are now a step-parent. So realize that when, you, you know, when that happens to you, certain things take place. First of all, you're stepping in from the outside of that family. So step parents are strangers who step in from the outside of life to the inner core of that family. And a lot of times one partner moves into the house of the other. And that means that this person has not only entered a house, but he, stepped, he or she has stepped into the memories, the special traditions, the jokes, the way of doing things. For step-parents, this may mean a, a certain time to learn the history and the language and the rhythm of that home and family. And it takes time to learn about relationships and routines and memories. You know, you're looking at the wall, there may be pictures there of you know, family outings that you're not in. So this can easily make a step-parent feel like, a, like an outsider, even if the family buys a new home, there are still plenty of reminders of the old life. You know, it'd be so helpful to remember to make the effort to both know about the past, but also to create memories of the new family so they can be added to the old. You know, I tell uh, people who are stepping into another family, if you don't have a camera, go get you one. Start snapping pictures, start taking pictures of the simple things that you do, you know, the birthday parties and the outings to the beach and so on and so forth. Start creating a new history. You're not going to eliminate the old history. You're not being asked even to, you know, oh, let's throw away all those old pictures. Of course not. You're simply, you know, the wise thing is to begin creating a new history that'll be added to the old. This is the history up until that time and then you know, we, we changed and we started this new history. It doesn't mean the old history was all bad, it just means now we have a new history. Children need to know that. So parents may change, but what makes a good and godly parent, you know, that, always stays the, that always stays the same. Um, you're also stepping into new responsibilities. You know, some, some people think that parenting is simply to provide food and clothing and education and, and discipline. Parents as step-parents are responsible for these things as well, but they're also responsible for attitudes that children develop as well. For example, attitude toward marriage itself. Think now for a second, think about this. Children in blended families may not be optimistic about marriage since they've seen the marriage of their parents dissolve. Do you ever think about that? They've been watching the dissolution of the marriage of their parents. You can't blame them if they are not high on marriage as they grow up. And so step parents, step parenting, needs to instill a positive and hopeful attitude about marriage and teach children about God's plan for marriage in the Bible. And you know, at some point, you know, your kids are going to be asking you deeper questions about what happened to your marriage. Why did mommy leave or why did daddy leave? You know, maybe not when they're six, but maybe when they're 16, they're going to look back and say, you know, what happened back there? Also, 
part of the training that step parents have to deal with is the attitude towards self-worth. Blended families have suffered setbacks and major adjustments, and these usually take a toll on a child's feeling of self-worth. The most common thing that children feel when a marriage falls apart is guilt. You know this. They, they ask, they wonder, was it my fault? Did I do something? Some children all of a sudden become really obedient and attentive to their parent, you know, their bio parent in the marriage after a divorce, thinking that good obedience and I'm going to follow the rules and I'm just going to be such a wonderful child and if I do that, daddy will come back. Because subconsciously they've said to themselves, I must have done something terrible to cause mom and dad to split up. And of course, we know that that's not true. But we're adults. That's, we know that that's not true because we're adults. We're mature. But that 12-year-old or that 15-year-old, they're not that mature. And that thought can easily get, into their, easily get into their minds. So an important task for step parents is to help the children feel good about themselves. Provide encouragement and positive reinforcement for the things that they do and uh, the things that they do well and uh, the good qualities that you perceive in them. They need to feel that they're okay. And part of a step parent's role is to you know, affirm them. You are okay. This has not, nothing to do with you. We have to also be aware of their attitude towards life itself. Children who lose parents tend to see life in terms of this one major event. In other words, Children who witness the dissolution of their parents' marriage seem to pick up the glasses of that, you know, that worldview, and they put that worldview on, and from here on in, they begin to see the world through the prism of the failure of their parents' marriage. They become pessimistic. They assume that life is not going to treat them right because it has already let them down in a big way. Step parents can help show them how to take these defeats and turn them into success and making them stronger. Succeeding at your marriage, if it's a second, whatever a subsequent marriage it is, succeeding at that goes a long way towards affirming the child and helping them have a positive outlook because they're able to say to themselves, hey, this terrible thing happened. This marriage fell apart for whatever reason. You know, I've said it before, you know, two partners are always, you know, there's always lots of guilt, you know what I'm saying? There's no such thing as one who's the innocent party and one who's the guilt. It don't work that way. So a child who sees you know, the, the weaknesses of their parents and they see the marriage fall apart, step parents and bio parents, by succeeding in their relationship, can instill hope in their child. So their child will be able to say, you know, I've seen defeat, but you know what? I've also seen success. I've also seen that this can work because mom really loves you know, my stepdad or vice versa, you know, and, and they look happy together and boy, nothing's going to take them apart. You know, and they, that gives them hope that yes, in life things go bad, but you know what? Sometimes in life also things can go, things can go well. So the more the, bland, uh, the blended family succeeds, the more the child has proof that good can come from bad. And also the attitude towards God. The best gift that a step parent can bring into this new family is a strong faith and a commitment to serve God. May not be easy because the family may not be where you are spiritually, and when this happens, you have to kind of show them Christ rather than presume you know, that they know what you know. If the step parent has no religious convictions, but the new family does have convictions, then it works the other way around. In either case, do not abandon the Lord for the new parent or family. Bring them to the Lord. All right, let's look at another you know, aspect of this uh, blended family. We talked about you, know, you step into a, a new family, you step into some new responsibilities. 
you're also stepping into new relationships. The hardest part of step parenting is developing simultaneous relationships with people who are not just, uh, who are not just potential friends that you can take or leave if you don't like them. In step parenting, you have to develop relationships with people um, who have become your family. People, you just, uh, you just can't ignore them or give up on them if it doesn't click. You, know, you meet somebody at work or at school or whatever, and you, know, you start a bit of a friendship, and then you find stuff out about them that you don't like, that get on your nerves. It's easy to kind of pull back a little bit, cool that thing off. Maybe you don't want to be such friends with them. But you can't do that when you enter into a new family and you, know, you have these kids. You can't say, well, I'm going to be cool with the second boy because uh, he gets on my nerves. You know, it doesn't work. The source book that I talked about before, that I've talked about before, provides eight steps to developing relationships in a blended family, and I want to share those with you very quickly this morning. Step one, accept the fact that you are a step parent. That's what you are. Because it is a blended family, there are limits on time, limits on history, limits on finances, and so on and so forth. You just have to accept that. But there is no limit on love, no limit on respect. The relationship of the past is limited. You have to accept that. But the future relationship is limitless. Work on that. Number two, educate yourself. Believe it or not, parenting is a learned skill. Nobody is born with the ability to parent. Most of us parent like our parents parented. And a lot of times that's where the trouble lies. Most people learn, as I say, from their parents and the day-to-day -day experience of raising their children from birth. But step parents have to take, you know, have to take over a parenting from a, a fixed point. Like I said, they have 10 years of experience of being a child, you have zero experience, if you have no children of your own, you have zero experience being a, a step parent. And maybe if you do have children of your own, it doesn't matter, these are not your bio kids. So ask questions. Go ahead, read a book once in a while. Consult others who are in the same boat. Join a group. Organize a group to help others and share what you've learned. The more you know, the better able you are to form uh, more satisfying relationships with your blended family. Step three, do not assume. Don't think that you know how to parent. You may have parented your children, but you're not parented, you've not parented these kids. These are different. These are not yours. You didn't raise these. So learn about their history and their needs and work towards understanding them. Set objectives. I mean, you can't tell how you're doing in the family unless you set objectives. School objectives, recreational objectives, church-related objectives, personal objectives. You know, what's a personal objective? Um, I'm going to see if I can settle arguments between the kids or between myself and the kids without yelling. Now I know you can't raise kids you know, in a lifetime without yelling. That's, like, that's impossible. You can't do that. But maybe you can resolve some debates between the kids. They're yelling and pulling and scratching each other. Uh, there's enough going on there without you having to, uh, having to add your own yelling and screaming to the, <laughs> to the mix. It's encouraging to be able to measure individual and group objectives as a family. Number five, be flexible yet firm. Firm in the sense that you mean what you say and you say what you mean. Your room needs to be picked up before 10 a.m. on Saturday and if it's not then don't even ask about going to a friend's house or blah blah blah. 10 after 10 Saturday morning you walk by they're still listening to the radio the clothes on the floor you know whatever nothing's picked up nothing's done. Okay, you, know, you, you, don't, you don't say a thing. And then somewhere around 2 p.m., Miss so-and-so comes out of her room, she's finally cleaned it, and she says, okay, I, I'm going over to Janet's house and we're going to do this, and then we're going roller skating. No, you're not. What do you mean? I said, I wanted your room cleaned up by 10 this morning. Well, I cleaned it up, so what? It's after lunch. I said, 
by 10 a.m. this morning. I said what I said, I mean what I mean. And you know, and I'm not telling you parents anything you don't already know, but I will tell you one thing, you don't have to do that very often for them to get the message. You do that once or twice, trust me, kids get the message that you really mean what you say. So you want to be flexible yet firm. Firm in the sense that there are rules and there are expectations. Flexible in the sense that you know that sometimes there are exceptions and that circumstances and lifestyle changes may cause you to kind of reevaluate earlier discussions and rules. So I'll go back to my original thing about get, getting the room clean at 10 a.m. You know, uh, you know, mom comes in and, and, or she says, well, I was about to start you know, and then mom asked me if I could help her go downstairs and do the, you know, things happen. This type of attitude enables children to feel secure and it encourages them to have an open and honest discussion with you. Step number six, market yourself. I know that sounds kind of strange. Remember, we're talking about step parents now, stepping in, market yourself. In most cases, the kids would rather have the old parent instead of you. Not always, but in most cases. So you need to kind of sell yourself a little to show that you want their approval and that their acceptance of you is important to you. I mean, it's discouraging to them if your attitude is that your position as parent has exclusively been decided by their other parent. They don't get a say. If you're too demanding, they may see the price of accepting you is, is way too high and they may become discouraged. If you don't demand anything at all and you don't ask for any respect, you know, let's just be buddies, that's the biggest danger by the way, step parenting, they want to be buddies instead of parents. Then they will not see your value to the family. I got buddies at school, I got buddies in the neighborhood, I, it's, a buddy is not what I need in my house, I need a parent in my house. They won't say that, but that's what subconsciously they're thinking. So show them your worth and, and desire to do a good job as a parent and a loving spouse to their other parent and they will eventually come to accept and value you as an equal partner in the family. You're not going to be the same as the parent who's gone, but you'll be an equal part of the family that, you know, that now exists. Step number seven, exercise forgiveness. There may be things said and done, especially at the beginning, that will be hurtful. You got to learn to forgive. The ability to forgive, you know. Uh, uh, what, do we have, what do we have to forgive children in a step-parent situation? Well, maybe we need to forgive unenthusiastic children. They act like they don't care if you're alive. Or you may have to forgive your parents who thought that you were crazy to marry into that family. Maybe you need to forgive them. And maybe you need to forgive your ex or your partner's ex. Or you need to forgive your in-laws. Or you may even need to forgive yourself for not being and doing all that you wanted to do. You had this high lofty idea when you entered this marriage as a step parent, you were going to do all these wonderful things. You know, and, and you realized, man, I, I didn't accomplish half of what I wanted to do. Sometimes you just need to forgive yourself. Give yourself a break. Believe me, there are enough people out there who will criticize you and put you down. You don't need to be one of those people. <laughs> so you need to be able to forgive all of these people and situations who will tear you down. You need to tear down the walls, heal the wounds, and show the beautiful spirit of Christ to your new family. And then finally, number eight, learn to laugh a little. Laughter is a bomb and a tremendous bonding exercise. Friendships are born when two people laugh together. Learn to laugh at yourself and encourage your partner to laugh at you, uh, laugh at your failings and your weaknesses and then just press on. You know, Solomon says that laughter is medicine for the soul. So let's kind of summarize. We've said a lot of things here today. In the end, it's the grace of God, it's the grace of God that has either supported you while you mourned a dead spouse, 
or a spouse that was gone. It was the grace of God that got you through that. It was the grace of God that helped you, to, uh, or rather that forgave you for failing at your first marriage. That has left you as a single person or a single parent. I tell people, God forgives murderers. He also forgives divorced people. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. It is a sin, it is a failing, but it is not an unforgivable one. God forgives. Why? Because the grace of God forgives us for failing. It's the grace of God that has strengthened you to go through the ordeal of being left by an unfaithful spouse. You know, if you're the quote, the victim, the person that really didn't want to get a divorce and's willing to work it out, doing whatever it took you know, to make things right, and then, but to no avail. It was the grace of God that helped you, you know, go through that terrible time. And it's the grace of God that has brought you to the point where you find yourself in a blended family situation. It is a favor of God that you now have another opportunity and another chance to get it right. So many people in subsequent marriages feel guilty all the time and they shouldn't. I tell you, if God has forgiven you, then you can forgive yourself. People want to succeed at marriage. Even people who are married the second time or the third time. Why? If they didn't want to succeed, why would they bother getting married? But we have to also understand that God wants you to succeed too. In all of these situations and more, God's grace has been with you to keep you, to save you, to keep you going, to keep your soul. If now you're in a new family, that same grace will enable you to find joy and peace and opportunities to serve the Lord and honor God with the family that He has now grafted together for your edification. So have faith, do your best, and depend on the Lord for all of your needs and all of your cares. And be confident that God will bless you and bless your blended family. Okay, so that's part three in that section of the blended family. We're going to continue uh, next week with our In Love for Life series. Thank you for your attention.